Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Amy Jandusa English, Project Director with the Energy Partnership Project at the National Community Action Partnership. And I can't get the slide to advance. There we go. Um, we do like to take a moment to remind everybody in the Community Action Network um, that now is the time to apply to get your CCAP. You can become a certified community action professional um, in 2023 if you go to communityactionpartnership.com slash CCAP. Now we're going to recite the promise of community action. I think that our audience today is full of community action members, so many of you probably know this by heart. Um, you're welcome to come off of mute and recite it with me. The promise of community action. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. All right, today's session, Community Action Conversation, water accessibility and affordability is going to be a panel discussion. We have four panelists today. And um, I think that we may have had a last minute change in the order of our panelists. So I'm going to invite um, one of our speakers to come on first. Who's gonna go first? Uh, I think I'll leave it off. Okay. Do you want me to advance to the next? Uh, well, first of all, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Larry Levine. I'm a director of urban water infrastructure and a senior attorney with Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, for anyone not familiar, we're a national and international environmental advocacy organization. Um, and I am, as you can see from the slide, I'm on our water team specifically. Great. So I am going to fast forward to your slides, Larry. Apologies to our attendees, our first speaker is delayed. Go back. There you go. There we go. Great. Okay, so it's great to be with you all. Thanks to Amy for hosting us, uh, having us here. Um, so the the core of the presentation on the webinar today is going to be this water affordability advocacy toolkit that um, NRDC and uh, National Consumer Law Center and CLC uh, published earlier this year in June. Um, and Cynthia is going to talk, Cynthia Zwick from Wildfire in Arizona is going to talk about how some of the issues um, that are explored in the toolkit play out in Arizona. Um, and uh, hopefully our, our first speaker, Brianna Parker, will be able to join us later as well. And she's going to present about a, a national coalition of groups that works on water affordability issues and a documentary film, actually, that they have just completed that really um, profiles and brings home how these issues affect people uh, and what some of the solutions are that people are fighting for in frontline communities. Okay, so next slide. Hold on a second. I keep having trouble getting the slides to advance. I do apologize. We might just have to look at it in this uh, view. Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right, great. So start off just with the challenge of unaffordable water and sewer service. Right. Um, energy affordability issues are pretty well understood um, and widely recognized. Water affordability issues uh, are becoming more and more recognized, but I think um, by and large, uh, less understood. And, and one of the things we aim to do uh, with this toolkit is to change that um, and also to put forward solutions, of course. So just some real quick context. Um, water and sewer rates have been rising much faster than inflation uh, for decades. Um, they've been rising faster than other essential goods and services as well, as shown on the, on the bottom graph here, including faster than, uh, than energy costs have been. 
And throughout that time, for the most part, uh, incomes, household incomes have stagnated, um, which is, to the simple math, led to greater affordability challenges uh, for people with their water and sewer bills. Okay, next slide. Um, there are some really important differences to keep in mind between the water sector and the energy sector as we get into this conversation. Um, so first is that the water sector is a lot more disaggregated than electricity uh, and gas. Um, there's you know, 4,500 or so electric plus gas utilities in the country. There's about 50,000 water systems. And that's just water. On the wastewater side, there's another 10 or 20,000. No one's even got a particularly accurate count. Um, that's a lot. Uh, and most of them are not regulated by a state utility commission. Uh, again, unlike the energy sector, where most are, uh, and most are investor-owned, in the water sector, most are publicly owned and not regulated by a state utility commission. And that makes a big difference in a whole lot of ways on everything from rate setting to consumer protections to assistance and affordability programs. Next slide. Uh, another correlate here of this, uh, the, that first point about the disaggregated nature of the sector, um, because there are so many, uh, many of them are very small. Um, most systems serve a very small population, some, some very small, under 500, you see at the left end of the graph here, um, many under 10,000. Um, the minority are larger, but serve most of the population. Um, so uh, at the right-hand side there, you see um, a large number of people served by a small number of, uh, of large systems that serve over 100,000 people. Next slide. Here's a similarity between water and energy, right? Um, they both are issues of environmental justice and racial justice. So just as we see with energy, um, the rising cost of water uh, results in economic hardship, um, psychological and physical stress, loss of water access due to shutoffs, uh, jeopardizes people's health, housing, custody of children, um, and these impacts are not evenly distributed. Um, the data that are available show a disproportionate impact on lower income and, uh, and communities of color. Um, this is a this slide here, the picture is a cover of a report by NAACP Legal Defense Fund from a couple of years ago that's an excellent report looking at um, looking at the, the racial dynamics of, uh, of water affordability and, and access, uh, tracing it back through time, uh, looking at the disparate uh, uh, inequitable investments in water infrastructure and redlining and how all these things have impacted where we are today. Next slide. So the human right to water, um, this is really a, a rallying cry by many uh, frontline advocates in the water space. Um, it's recognized in international law, the UN has declared that there is a human right to both safe and clean drinking water and sanitation, um, and has elaborated that that human right includes affordable access to water and sanitation. It's not codified in US, federal law, um, as unfortunately many international human rights are not. Um, but some states have started to recognize it as a matter of state law. And a couple of examples, uh, California um, about a decade ago adopted a human right to water law. Virginia, the legislature adopted a resolution, uh, I believe it was last year. And there are some similar bills pending in other states. Next. Uh, and let's see, I think Olivia, I'm handing off to you, I think, on this one. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Olivia Wine, staff attorney uh, with the National Consumer Law Center. Um, our colleague, uh, Karen Lusson, who I think is also on this um, uh, with us today, um, spearheaded this uh, principles document, and there's a companion document on how you would implement these principles, but it's a recognition um, and a framing of uh, essential utility service as a human right. And um, 
a lot of groups uh, that you may be familiar with have signed on to this document. And we really think that uh, it is a better starting point than the current sort of lay of the land um, and treatment of a utility service as just another kind of business. Um, next slide. I'll keep going. Um, so looking at uh, water affordability and sort of the challenges of dealing with 50,000 different drinking water systems, a very disaggregated sort of landscape, um, led us to wonder what would be helpful for folks out in the field helping households dealing with unaffordable water. So um, NRDC and NCLC started by interviewing um, water affordability advocates, activists, academics from around the country. Um, and to sort of hear their stories and hear how um, unaffordable water was touching their communities and sort of manifesting itself and what would be helpful. So we were hearing some common themes and we focused our water affordability advocacy toolkit on, on 10 areas. Um, there are more than 10 affordability areas. And this is really um, um, a toolkit focused from the individual household uh, point of view uh, versus a system-wide point of view. So when we're talking about affordable water bills, it's not from the water system itself, but looking at from that individual household, you know, can that household pay for all essential necessities, including water? Um, or is that water bill just so high that sacrifices are going to have to be made? And if so, um, what what are the consequences and how do we start tackling some of these challenges? So we um, started drafting in these 10 issue areas, which I'll go into in the next few slides, sort of clumping them together um, under larger canopies and then shared the drafts with um, the folks we interviewed and others around the country that we know are dealing with water issues and sought their feedback. It was an iterative process. Um, all errors, uh, points of view, they're ours. We claim them. Uh, we please do not blame anybody that we interviewed. Um, yay, uh, Brianna is joining us. OK, next slide, please. Um, here's a list of uh, folks uh, that we interviewed and um, folks that also reviewed the, the drafts that we were coming out with. Uh, and we are forever grateful. We, uh, it was a lot of time and a labor of love. Olivia, how did you select the um, the stakeholders to participate in that group? Because it's a good um, representative, diverse sort of group. Yeah, we we knew of some of the groups out there already that were working on water because they had reached out to our organizations or were part of coalitions but we actively and intentionally sought for a range we wanted a diversity around the country we wanted sort of you know almost like scope or point of view diversity so you've got legal services you've got you know academics you've got folks that were sort of the accidental advocate. They saw something was really not right in their community. Their water bill was off. It seemed awfully high. Talking to neighbors, their water bills were high. Common problems, mobilization, activism. You know, so just the range. Um, next slide. So, we designed this as a resource. And again, um, it's in modules. So you'll notice that each of the, the modules can be taken alone. Um, if you do issue spotting and you say, ah, we're seeing this problem and this problem and this problem, you know, pull those three modules, use them together. It's really, you know, you can, if you want to print out all of the modules and, you know, make a, a, a report and go through it cover to cover, but um, it's really designed to be standalone modules. You'll notice that there are a lot of endnotes, and those are really sort of 
you know, the, this, the breadcrumb trail to lead you to examples that we were able to find of solutions, um, examples where other communities were ex experiencing this particular issue. Um, so it's chock full of endnotes and the endnotes we hope will be valuable to you. And some of the sections also have appendices with additional resources. Um, but really also we're hoping that local officials who want to be proactive about water affordability, take a look at this and sort of, you know, help them identify like common problems, some common solutions and perhaps start a dialogue. Um, but we can get into that later. One of the modules we're going to feature is, um, you know, ways we can hold public officials accountable for the policies and programs created. Next slide. Apologies, Olivia. I was having trouble with getting the slides to advance. Sometimes I may have to. No worries. Um, you know, I'm gonna hand this off to Larry, and then I'll I'll we'll pass it back and forth between us because otherwise I will be talking through the whole hour, which I I like to do, but I should share. Yeah. Thanks, Olivia. Yeah. Th do, you, thanks for... do you guys want to stop for questions? I, I saw some things happening in the chat, but I can't see the screen completely. No, I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, go ahead. All right, and, and thanks, Olivia, for taking that where I handed off before. The, the slide numbering changed a bit, the intro slide, so I that that uh, threw off my cue on where to hand off. But um, So what, what will we find in each module? Um, so, as we were saying, it's the toolkit is modular, so it can be used. Um, we'll go run through what the topics are and do a deep dive on a few of them. Um, it can be used as a whole, um, or it, you can pick up the section on shutoffs and look at policies around shutoff protections. You could pick up the module on, um, on water efficiency assistance programs and look at that one. Right. So in each module, you'll find an in-depth explanation of the topic. Uh, questions that can help advocates assess gaps in state and local laws and policies. So some, some prompts to get you thinking about what the situation is, um, the lay of the land where you are. Um, examples, this is the footnotes, um, the, the end notes, examples of strong state and local programs, policies, and consumer protections from around the country. And this includes a lot of analogies from the energy utility sector. Um, so the, the main text of each module synthesizes some of those examples, uh, highlights a few, but you'll find in references more examples and also the links to the underlying original sources of where a particular program lives online or a particular um, rule or regulation. Um, it flags pitfalls to look out for in doing this work and offers some additional policy ideas that may not yet be in effect anywhere, um, but, but other ideas to consider. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here are the modules. Um, and, and one thing I, I should say before going through this, and if I, if I hadn't before. Sorry. He, you know, I've talked about differences between the water and the energy sector. Um, a core difference that goes to all of the issues, all the modules here, is that there's a lot more there in the energy sector than there is in the water sector right now. Um, it's partly a function of those differences I talked about before, where it's disaggregated, where there's not utility commission oversight uh, over rate setting or over standardized consumer protections. Um, there is not a lie heap for water right now, apart from on a temporary basis with COVID, COVID dollars and COVID relief dollars. Right? There's a whole slew of things that are taken for granted in need of improvement in the energy sector, but taken for granted that they exist um, that are just not there in the water sector. And so that's that's one of the themes that um, that emerges through this. Um, so there are the first set of modules. It's broken into sort of three groups. The first set is around protecting people from losing access to water. What happens when the bill is not affordable and somebody's got that bill and they can't pay it? Right. So there are modules on water shutoffs, preventing those. Um, water liens. This is something that arises in the water context in a, in a way that it typically does not in the energy context. This is because most systems are municipal water systems, publicly owned local government water systems, and they have the ability 
to collect on debt by placing a lien on your property, the same as a property tax lien, um, and ultimately foreclosing on your home. You could lose your home for inability to pay a water bill. There's a module around that um, and, and policies to protect against it. Um, there's a module on water debt, for people in arrears, what kinds of policies and programs can come into play there. Um, billing problems and dispute resolution. Uh, this is something also where, um, and Olivia can correct me if I'm wrong, but since she does energy work as well, which I do not uh, really directly do, um, but billing is a mess for many water systems. Again, partly because they are, many of them are small and there's limited oversight uh, um, of these municipal systems and they vary widely in quality uh, in terms, well, in quality in terms of drinking water at times, but also uh, in quality in terms of customer service and basic billing uh, operations. And then last, um, there's a module about renters and protections and support for renters in particular. And here's another distinction between water and energy is that most renters are not the customer of the water utility. Typically it's the landlord. Um, this is especially true for multifamily buildings because there's usually uh, buildings are master metered for water. There's not an individual water meter for each apartment or, or condominium unit. Um, and even in single family rental housing, uh, many municipal water systems um, insist on having the property owner be the account holder. And that's in part so they can use liens to collect on debt. Uh, and so there are all these issues manifest differently um, when it comes to renters who are not the account holder. Uh, and that means a different set of challenges and solutions. Next slide. Okay, the second grouping um, of modules is about making essential water services affordable for low-income households. So how to prevent getting to the point where somebody's got that bill they can't pay. Um, and there are four modules here. Um, one is on affordability and assistance programs. Uh, Olivia is going to get into depth on that one. Um, there's a module also, though, on equitable water rates. Um, so thinking about not only means-tested approaches, um, how to have targeted support for low-income households, uh, but also thinking about the underlying rate design, rate structure, how that affects who pays how much. Um, differences between uh, a uniform rate and an inclining block rate, um, and how that affects the distribution of costs for low-income households, even though that rate is not based on income, um, things of that nature, right? We've got, we've got a, a module on that, and it's actually a critically important um, issue. Um, there's a module on water efficiency and plumbing repair assistance. Again, in the energy sector, well-recognized energy efficiency has got to be part of the solution to reducing low-income energy bills. In the water sector, and I'll get into this with a little bit of a dive into this module later, um, there's less appreciation of that, I would say, um, but, but growing. And then the renters issue, same deal here uh, around keeping bills affordable. There are costs that are passed on the renters, even though they're not the account holder. Um, it's factored into rent in one way or another. Um, and so there are issues around how to um, mitigate the impact of water costs on housing costs for those who are not directly paying the water bill. Okay, next slide. Okay, and then lastly, there's a, a couple of modules um, on enabling more effective advocacy. There's two things here. Uh, the first is on data collection and transparency. Uh, there's a, a lot of data gaps around understanding in a particular place, a particular city or a particular state, uh, the nature and extent of water affordability challenges. Uh, again, in part because it's disaggregated, in part because the oversight works differently without a utility commission. Um, and so there are uh, th there's progress being made on that front in some places and something that we hope to see replicated more. Um, and the last one on accountability and participation in decision-making. Um, this one is, is split into two parts, one that focuses on investor-owned or commission-regulated utilities and ways to improve upon the processes of commission oversight and opportunity for engagement by residents in those decisions made by commissions. And a part of this module is on the non-commission regulated publicly owned systems um, and ways of making that uh, process, those decision-making processes more accessible um, and more able to be 
uh, influenced for the good by people who are meant to be benefiting from the services provided by these utilities. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now we're going to go into a, a peek into four of the modules, um, the affordability and assistance programs, debt, data collection, and water efficiency. And I'll hand it back to Olivia. Thanks, Larry. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the affordability and assistance programs module is probably the thickest of the modules. Our initial aim was to keep these really in bite-sized digestible uh, pieces. But uh, as we know, this is, this is quite a topic. We were very intentional about um, how we defined or distinguished between affordability programs and assistance programs. Affordability uh, programs were the gold standard. Those were the ones designed to get that bill to the point where it was affordable for the individual household. That household would not need to sacrifice any other basic necessities um, in order to pay that bill. It was more tailored. Assistance programs, and, and there, there aren't many under the affordability umbrella, and the assistance programs, um, that's a broad umbrella. It covers everything from crisis assistance to um, some discount rates, um, but because it's sort of a one size fits all or very, very limited sources of funding, uh, it, the, the design isn't tailored or the goal isn't to make you know, each of the household bills affordable. Um, it's more you know, closer to keeping the costs under control and administrative efficiency. And you will notice if you um, work with water utilities that I think um, affordability and assistance programs are used interchangeably by others, but we just wanted to be clear how we were using the terms um, in this module. And we, highlight the percentage of income payment plans um, under the affordable affordability program section. And it also includes, you know, certain types of tiered discounts, because if you have enough tiers, you can really sort of get closer to affordable for the household where more assistance is directed to those households with um, more limited incomes. Uh, we tried to find examples uh, in other states for you of um, these types of programs. And we were looking also for um, state and federal strategies to overcome program implementation barriers as well as funding opportunities. So next slide. Um, one of the, one of two, <laughs> or these are the two PIPs, water PIPs in the country, uh, first and second in the nation. There's the Philadelphia Tiered Assistance Program and the Baltimore Water for All. And these are, um, again, percentage of income payment plans or tiered assistance where the lower the household income, the greater the amount of assistance. They're fairly new. Um, also, there is the another program component built on top of the affordable rate, which is um, a rearage forgiveness. So, you know, either after a certain period of on-time payments, an, a certain amount of arrearage is forgiven, or it's immediately thereafter. You know, monthly bill paid on time, one twelfth of the arrears forgiven. That's the sort of type of matchup. Um, and we also highlighted some energy PIPs as well um, in this section. Next slide. I noted before that in addition to the modules, some of the modules have appendices. So this is an example of what you'd find in the appendix, um, in the appendices for the affordability and assistance module. It's a comparison chart of um, the two PIP programs I talked about, Philadelphia and Baltimore, and just sort of where they structured their tiers and um, what uh, percentage of household income they were aiming for, uh, for each tier. But you will notice the common denominator that um, the lower the income, zero to 50% of federal poverty, um, 
would pay, you know, the least, the smallest amount for their water bill. Okay, next slide. All right. No worries, no worries. Um, I, I was just gonna, the next slide is gonna feature um, some of the highlights. We highlight best practices um, that we see in programs. And, you know, this ranges from inclusive program rules and benefit levels, ways to maximize participation, engaging the most impacted communities in the development and implementation of these programs, and in, you know, the accountability piece, ensuring regular reporting and evaluation of the program implementation. And this is so that it can be iterative and get stronger as you go. Um, I'm gonna turn it to Larry for the next slide, uh, focusing on state water affordability and assistance programs, an example of state, state, statewide water assistance. Sure, thanks. Um, so the you know, right right now, every state except one, North Dakota, um, is on a temporary basis operating an assistance program, which is the Low Income Home Water Assistance Program, um, funded with the COVID relief dollars that I mentioned earlier. And, and you know, many community action agencies are engaged in that as well. Um, but there's not a single state that has a permanent program of any sort. Um, there's there's no permanent federal LIWOP, and there is no permanent state program uh, of, of any sort for water assistance either. The most work that's been done on trying to develop a statewide program has been in California. We just wanted to highlight this, and it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, reference, um, the materials that were developed as part of this effort there. Um, there was a, a law that required uh, several years ago required the state water board in California to develop a proposed program design for a statewide water assistance program. Um, and they went through a, a pretty extensive process uh, with workshops and stakeholder input and a draft report and comments on a draft report and finalizing it with a whole bunch of appendices. Um, it's called the AB 401 report for short because uh, that's the law that required it, uh, Assembly Bill 401. Um, there's the cover image of it. And it resulted in a bill being introduced um, in the current session of the California legislature to actually enact a program modeled on what this report proposed. Um, an update since the last time we actually made this presentation is that the bill passed the legislature and was just within the last week vetoed by the governor. Um, ironically, um, the, the veto was because it would, because it wasn't funded. Um, the, the, the strategy, I'll, I won't go too far off on a tangent here, but the, the strategy of advocates on this was to try to get a program enacted and authorized, um, and then figure out how to fund it. Um, and because it, finding a permanent ongoing funding source for a program is really the biggest challenge in trying to get a state program going. Uh, and rather than hold things up entirely, they wanted to keep some momentum going from this report, this program design that the state water board developed, try to get that authorized and work towards um, uh, funding at the same time as, as uh, putting pieces into place to be able to be ready to implement. Um, the, the governor said, it's a great idea, but I don't want to have pressure on me to fund it when you haven't identified a funding source yet, and he vetoed it, uh, which is really unfortunate. Uh, but I would expect this one to be back. Uh, so keep an eye out on this one. Next slide. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm mindful that we've got two other pre presentations. So uh, we're going to go a little bit quicker to finish our, our portion so that we can turn it over um, to our next two speakers. But highlighting water debt. Um, and, and we will note that liens, <laughs> which are the ultimate and very powerful mechanism <laughs> for addressing water debt by a municipality, that was so important that it got its own module. This water debt module focuses on, um, you know, eliminating punitive fees and penalties, um, water debt forgiveness programs, um, short-term crisis assistance grants, arrearage management plans, and fair and reasonable deferred payment plans. That was the last option intentionally. Okay, next slide. 
Uh, this is an example, again, I had mentioned that Philadelphia and Baltimore's PIP programs had an arrearage management and arrearage forgiveness component. Um, other programs that we are highlighting, Chicago's Utility Billing Relief Program and Pittsburgh's Bill Discount Program also have um, an arrearage forgiveness component built in. So it's a nice way to think of AMPS to couple them with um, your assistance program. Next slide. Larry, you want to just bring it home? Sure. Um, so two more modules we'll, we'll touch on. So the data collection and transparency module. Um, so we've got discussion in here of the, mo the main thing is this first bullet, um, finding, uh, developing policies to have uniformity and standardized mandatory reporting uh, of utility level data, ideally at the zip code level or the census tract level. Um, to have some transparency around shutoffs, around arrears, around liens, around assistance programs that are made available locally, around deferred payment agreements and how successful they are or are not, uh, around just even around rates and what average and median bills are, because I'm a water side without uh, regulated rate setting, it's that information is disaggregated as well and often hard to find. Um, so transparency laws. Um, is, is, a, is a big one. Illinois uh, is a, a leader in having adopted a, a, a transparency law for energy and water systems that are regulated by the State Utility Commission. It was adopted last year and is being implemented. Um, New Jersey just passed a law. Uh, this uh, it was just signed last month, um, requiring a very similar set of data to be reported by all energy and water utilities, including publicly owned ones. Both of those models are, are you know, referenced in here. Um, the, uh, the other piece of this, is of this module is around uh, ways of getting data from individual utilities through public record requests, a state equivalent of, of a FOIA request, um, or through intervening in rate proceedings, or in some cases through uh, litigation um, where utility practices uh, have been challenged in court. Next. Uh, here's that uh, Illinois law. Um, California also has some water reporting that covers um, publicly and privately owned systems under something called the Shutoff Protection Act in California. Um, Wisconsin has some very basic reporting. They, their utility commission regulates all water systems, including publicly owned, and the utility commission itself imposed some uh, requirements around just reporting shutoffs and, and, uh, and liens. Uh, there were some additional reporting requirements in various states adopted during COVID, uh, and that's something actually that the Illinois and New Jersey laws built upon that uh, to make reporting permanent. Next. Okay, and then last, uh, water efficiency and plumbing repair assistance. So the, the key point here, um, there's some very simple interventions that can save a lot of water and therefore a lot of money. Uh, toilet replacement, best example. Um, uh, a lot of older housing has toilets that are several decades old uh, and that use four or five times as much water as a modern water efficient toilet. Um, uh, it can be hundreds of dollars a year, in, a year in savings, depending on how high a water bill is in a particular, how high water rates are in a particular place. Um, it's been, you know, various places have uh, had in the past um, uh, voucher or, or, or rebate programs uh, for water, for toilet replacement, but you've got to have the money up front to be able to pay for the toilet and have it installed. Um, and that's typical of, of many sorts of water efficiency assistance programs. And so in practice, it ends up leading out most low income households. Uh, and so a move towards a, a more of a direct install model um, where there's no out of pocket cost uh, to the to the homeowner, um, having a program that comes in and just does that replacement, does that work. Um, is something we highlight in this module is that that could be integrated with existing energy efficiency assistance programs. Um, because there, as you know, there are such programs targeted at low-income households um, in the energy space. And at the same time that those programs are having a, a, a touch point with, um, uh, with a participant on energy, they can be working on water as well if there are ways that could be found to, to fund that and to uh, administer that collaboratively um, in an integrated way. So I think that's a real opportunity um, for, for progress and for improvement and for, uh, for creativity at the local level. Next. All right. Um, so that really that closes 
closes out the, the substance of, of our presentation on the toolkit. Um, we're going to be continuing to promote this um, through more webinars, through some blog posts, um, trying to get the word out in whatever way we can, um, and encourage you to, to do so um, as well. Uh, there's a, a web link um, at, at the end of the presentation, and I think Jenna can be forwarded um, you know, afterwards as well um, with, uh, with the entire um, uh, toolkit available. All right, I think that's it. And there's the link. And we would, in addition to taking questions at the end of this, we'd love to connect with anyone afterwards as well. And then are we going to uh, transition to Cynthia or to Brianna? Uh, Cynthia, and then uh, close out with Brianna's um, trailer. Great, thank you. Um, it, and I, you know, I, I want to start out just by thanking um, Olivia and Larry for this work uh, and others in their organizations. I think this toolkit is essential um, and it's the first of its kind and it's a powerful uh, set of materials and policies and program ideas uh, for all of us who are working in this space or who want to become more active in um, water uh, advocacy or water system advocacy, affordability, all of these things. Um, uh, my name is Cynthia Zwick. I'm with Wildfire Igniting Community Action to End Poverty in Arizona. We're the state association here in Arizona and have been somewhat involved in water advocacy in the past, but it's an area that we want to get much more engaged in. And it's, it's amazing to me, really, the similarities in need and policy, um, both from in need for this in this area, both from a policy and a programmatic perspective, and how it really parallels, I think, the need that's out there for many of us in the uh, energy sort of electric gas space as well. This the similarities, unfortunately, are so are, are so aligned. Um, I think, you know, as I thought about sort of this presentation and getting ready for this, I was really thinking a lot about the opportunities that have come to us as a result of COVID. And while I don't think any of us would ever ask for that or ask for anything similar going forward, I do think it has helped increase awareness about the need for clean, affordable water in communities. And Brianna is really gonna speak to how that was demonstrated before COVID hit, I think, but also, I think now everywhere across the country, there's a heightened awareness about the need for it, um, which I think is a good thing, um, but clearly there's still a lot more work to do. Um, and I think I just as a shout out to community action agencies, knowing how engaged you all are in the service delivery for these programs and other programs, I think adding this to your portfolio of advocacy is essential um, because of the implications when which you all see on a day-to-day -day basis of families unable to afford to pay their water bill. You know, it's, it's devastating. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening in Arizona and what we're doing here in Arizona. And I, I know that uh, we've just hired another um, person, Claire Michael, who I think has joined the call, um, who is gonna be helping us in this space and helping us really increase capacity so that we can, can move forward. Thanks, Claire, for turning on your camera. I appreciate that. Um, so I just, I wanted to share, and I think many of you probably know, but Arizona is a pretty diverse state from a variety, in a variety of ways. Um, we have very large urban centers like Phoenix and Tucson. And then we have these very, very small rural communities that are served by, as Larry and Olivia alluded, very, very small uh, water companies. In Arizona, there are 400 regulated water companies. Uh, and then there are a bunch of municipalities that don't have the same kind of regulation that goes along with um, some of the other requirements in some of the other states. And so, you know, they're, they're very different environments in which, in which we have to operate. The city of Phoenix, as an example, um, I just want to sort of talk about how they, how they manage their program and, and our interaction with them on an ongoing basis. The city of Phoenix has a program, um, well, for, first to start, start out, they serve millions of customers. So across the city of Phoenix, they're serving millions of customers, many of whom 
uh, are low income, many of whom may or may not be paying the bill directly. As Larry alluded to, we have a lot of multi-housing uh, low income um, complexes around, hopefully we'll have more soon that are affordable. Um, but in March of uh, uh, 2021, the city of Phoenix, the city council approved a six and a half percent rate increase for water customers, which is pretty devastating when you think of the timing. And then a year later, they, they approved another three and a half percent increase. So over the course of two years, it was a 10 percent increase in rates. Um, that, that was largely due to um, what they were concerned about, which is an infrastructure issue, paying for pipes, paying, restoring pipes that have gone, you know, that are old, that need to be replaced, that need to be improved. But that's a 10% increase at a time when most families are struggling to just make ends meet and maintain their living, right? So that was a, a huge concern that we had. The city of Phoenix doesn't have a specific bill assistance program. They, they, uh, the city does have one of the public community action agencies here. So there's a nice nexus there where the agency can interact with the water department, but the resources available are inadequate to meet the need for customers, unfortunately. Um, our state agency is administering the water program, which, and I wanna circle back uh, to a question about monitoring those programs and see if NCLC or NRDC are doing any of that. But our state agency is administering those programs. So we don't have direct access to those either. With the ARPA funding that came through, the community action agencies have developed programs to assist city of Phoenix residents. But here's what happens in the city of Phoenix if you get behind on your bill. If you become delinquent, um, within 31 days, you can have a shutoff of your water. They also have what they, they term, and I know this is one of Olivia's favorite programs, is a low flow water program. So before they completely shut you off, they will reduce the flow of water to your home, which they, they articulate, and I know that this is a fairly common articulation, so I'm not picking on them necessarily, but it's articulated, it's better to have some water than no water in your home, right? The problem is that the, the level of the flow is really insufficient to sustain um, the health of the family. And God forbid there's an emergency like a kitchen fire where there isn't enough or a fire in the home anywhere where there isn't sufficient water to be able to put that out. So we really have some concerns about the safety of a program like that. And obviously we would rather families are not disconnected and we would rather the, the bills are affordable. So that's something we'll, we will begin working on in the water space. But as an example, the city of Phoenix charges a service charge, a basic service charge of 464 to 603 for a residential customer, depending on the size of the pipe going into their home. Um, so that's, a, that's kind of a standard. If, if you are disconnected or if you are shut off, if your water is shut off, and you pay by the end of by you pay by 5 p.m. that day, your water will be restored the following business day. But if your if your water is just is shut off on a Friday and there's a holiday or there's any kind of you know longer term situation, you will not have your water restored until the next business day. So you can go three to four days uh, in the city of Phoenix without water, which is a problem, obviously. Um, so we we are I mean, much more. I thought we were already recording. <laughs> I, I thought anyway. so too. I'm not sure why that happened. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, so we, we'll be coming much more involved in that pro, in that process and engaged in in the, the advocacy at the city level as well. The other the other program that I wanted to share a little bit about is the Global Water Program. So Global Water is a private regulated company here in Arizona, and they largely serve rural communities. And I will, I will acknowledge that they have a very robust bill assistance program in place, and we administer that on their behalf. And the customers um, can be at 200% of the federal poverty level to receive the assistance. During COVID, they increased that to 300%. In a recent rate case, they attempted to maintain that level of, of um, eligibility and one of and to the staff of the ACC along with the residential consumer office here fought it and it got dropped back to 200. But in comparison to the city of Phoenix, they have a monthly service charge of um, 
uh, sorry, I just lost it, of $30 a month, depending on the area. And it can go up to as much as $70, depending on the area that they serve and the number of customers that they're delivering water to. So you can see that, you know, depending on where you live, affordability is affected as it is often with, with electricity and gas and propane and other fuel sources. Um, but the, the program that they have in place, as I mentioned, is helpful because they have a program that's set aside for uh, military personnel, for disabled veterans, uh, for seniors. So it's a really robust program um, and, and can, but more can be done. And as I said, they just uh, had a, a rate increase approved by the Corporation Commission. So rates will be going up in the, in the Global Water Service territory as well. So I think, did I just get knocked out? No, guys... I can still hear you. Okay, for some reason my screen went away. Apologies for, the, for that. Um, anyway, so we're working closely to develop relationships with the folks at these companies so we can raise awareness and, and really work from the inside out. Um, it's always much easier to do that than it is to come from the outside in, I think, though a partnership where both of those things are happening is sometimes necessary. Uh, we're working with the city and the city council members uh, to also just increase awareness about how we can improve the systems there. Um, I think it's fair to say that we will be working on affordability programs here and affordability policies as we're doing in the electric arena. Um, but to suggest that they're easy, easy to get through, I think is, is um, wouldn't be a fair statement. But not, nonetheless, it's essential and we will be continuing, uh, continuing that work. And I think, you know, I, I think the I, it, we've neglected that space. And I think a lot of organizations have kind of neglected that the, the advocacy in the water space. And now is, I think now is a key opportunity um, for us all to, to be more aware, to really engage more, to better understand the issues and use this toolkit that has been made available because it really, you don't have a lot to work to do other than making the policies that are recommended happen. Um, which is not always easy, but at least it's laid out for us and it really is uh, a, an opportunity for us to take this toolkit and run with it. And so we, we look forward to using it um, as we go forward. Thank you so much for highlighting that, Cynthia, because we're grateful that you represented uh, community action in this space, right? Because water has not always been the territory of our community action uh, network. I know that historically some of our agencies have used CSBG funds to run uh, water bill payment assistance programs, but it has been other groups like our last speaker um, that have led the charge on some of this water advocacy. So I just want to let folks know that we have six minutes left in the appointed uh, time slot for the webinar. We're happy to go over time if necessary, but I want to pivot to Brianna Parker um, and give her as much time as possible to finish her segment. So I'm gonna share her slides. And Brianna, I'm gonna have you come off mute and start talking. And tell us okay, the, sure. Thank you. Tell us about yeah, the National so Coalition for Legislation on Affordable Water. Yeah. I, and tell us about I yourself will. as well. Hello. Sure, sure, sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Brianna Parker. Um, I work at an organization based in Chicago. It's a national implementation organization. It's called Elevate, formerly known as Elevate Energy. Um, and yeah, there I uh, work on water and energy. And I also, like in my spare time, well, before I even worked at Elevate, I was a volunteer for an organization, uh, the People's Water Board, a community organization uh, of activists in Michigan. Um, it's called the People's Water Board of Michigan, and they've done a lot of work around um, affordability, and now they're in the space of, uh, you know, thinking about transparency. And a couple of years ago, uh, we worked on uh, just sessions with community groups from across the country to come up with um, some of the information that I'm going to share right now. So next slide, please. All right. So I'll talk about like, you know, what we do. And then this film um, that I'm going to show, it's a quick trailer. It's highlighting storytelling. I know that this uh, previous speakers talked a lot about some of the um, the policy solutions and just case studies of like what people are going through. I, I think our film is a good, um, a good combination of like why the stories of individuals are important. Next slide, please. 
Sorry, Brianna, I've been having trouble getting the slides to advance in the Zoom. Bear with me. There we go. Okay. It, okay. Okay. All right. So like I said, um, the organization, uh, you can go to the next slide, so I'll just go briefly over the slide. So the organization is a long, long line of uh, organizational work. Um, the People's Water Board, it was born out of anchor organizations, one of which the organization that I'm a part of is called Michigan Welfare Rights. And so there was two convenings. Next slide, please. There was two convenings, one in 2014 and one in 2017, for organizations across the country to come together to talk about affordability, access to water um, because of droughts in some places, and also like uh, you know some of the contamination that's, that's that's in our waters. So it's based in Michigan, and I'll go directly to that. You can go to the to the next part. Okay. All right. So I'm going to show the trailer. And then after the trailer, I'll talk about how you guys can like just get information on screenings because we're doing screenings right now. Um, like I said, this is just a good segue into like the work that's already been shared. So if you, I'll, I'll go on mute right now, Amy, and, and you can show the tra trailer and I'll talk about like some of the next steps that we're working on. Great. And this is a great way to close out the webinar because this is a very compelling film clip. can't hear it. Oh no. And it might be like the zoom in might, you know, sometimes they'd be like, oh, you gotta share with sound. So it might be that. Bear with me. I'm gonna see if I can get the sound to come on. Yeah, you might have to stop it and share it again. That's what happened last time. Now I'm hearing it on my laptop, but I don't know. Yeah, that's because you got it. Because it's just gonna show for you. You got to stop and share your screen again and, and share with sound. Yep. Okay, I see the box for share sound. Thank you for bearing with me here. Are we here? Are you guys hearing it? Imagine you're on the Titanic. Yes. All okay. of the lifeboats are gone. You have to not only find a way to stay alive, but you have to fix it so that this circle. Oops. Imagine you're on the Titanic. All of the lifeboats are gone. You have to not only find a way to stay alive, but you have to fix it so that this circumstance doesn't happen again. The watering facility is uh, where people have to drive in from miles and miles and miles and miles out with you know, the water barrels. We are left with millions of cubic yards of radioactive material. I started to keep all of these water quality violations every single quarter, every single year. 2002, 2003, 2004. We're paying more for water than anybody around here, and it ain't fit to drink. The monoculture of corn, soybean, hog, it is the dominant force in Iowa politics. They want to externalize the costs of production by putting a mess in the river that those of us downstream who depend on those rivers for drinking water uh, have to finance to clean up. I was getting water bills that were topping like four and five hundred dollars a month. My water was shut off for eight weeks. Do we become fiscally responsible where we have, hey, we got a great credit rating, but we've got 500,000 more people without water. You need to pay $1,000 today, right now. It's like some things is not doable. There's nobody that doesn't need water. It shouldn't be something that somebody will lose a home over. 
Miss Trader called me $114,000. And we don't have a separate tank because it's caused more than this house worth right now. I learned that people were being arrested because they had problems with on site sanitation. This is along the Selma to Montgomery Marsh Trail. Every year, business people get on the bus and go and worship at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But all along, off these side roads where people are living in conditions that are akin to places around the world that don't have the kind of wealth that exists in this country, it makes absolutely no sense. The water crisis is a political crisis. If you try to fix water quality without addressing the power structure, then you're not fixing anything anyway. I think I'll probably die thinking that I ain't done enough. Uh, yeah, stay up. <laughs> what do we get for what we gave? And survival should be the bare minimum. So, um, I think that so the next slide is just information about, um, uh, it's just information about uh, our screening and I can share that with Amy so you, so you can send around, but mm -hmm. we're doing individual um, organizational screenings right now just to get people information about the film. Um, we also have a discussion guide coming up just for community groups to talk about like what they can do about water that includes just information that was shared today. Um, and yeah, we are also like writing legislation around uh, water, national legislation around water affordability and just trying to educate, it's all in the name. And so hopefully uh, this film is compelling and useful for your, um, for your work. I know that assistance and affordability is it's, it's really hard and nobody can live without water. So um, looking forward to doing screenings with you all and just getting involved in like what's happening in your region. That's all right. I have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brianna, for joining us and sharing that film clip. Um, the, the QR code that was on the screen is if you scan it with your cell phone, you can um, automatically access the video and all of the information about how to schedule a screening or how to download a toolkit or how to work with um, Brianna's organization will be in the email that we send out to attendees and registrants uh, at the end. So I would encourage everyone on today's webinar um, to share the links that you're going to receive in your email widely in your community, because if it's not your organization, it may be one of your partner organizations that has a vested interest in water affordability and accessibility and water quality and everything that we've uh, talked about today it are all great resources um, to help any community group, whether it's community action or outside community action. Um, do we have any questions? I know that we did go over time a little bit today, um, but I wanna thank our presenters for having so much uh, dense content. You've hit us with so much information that I'm struggling to even formulate questions. And I see some good conversations taking place in the chat as well. Okay, well, I don't want to take up any more of your day. I know for some of you, it's almost the end of the day if you're on the East Coast. So thank you for um, spending time with us today and listening to this uh, information about water. And I look forward to potentially having additional content around water affordability and accessibility in the future, because as I said, this is a very important topic for our community action network. Um, and it's an emerging topic and it's something that we can get on board with and get ahead of in a timely fashion. Um, and I think, as we said in the beginning, I like the way that Larry framed the fact that water can be understood in the context of energy, because so many of us are used to thinking about gas and electricity affordability. Um, and, you know, the, the structures for billing and delivering water are different than they are for gas and electricity. The regulatory structures are different um, and the price structures are different. But for the individual household, it's all the same pot of money that they're using to pay those bills. And so the more that they have to pay on the water bill, the less that they have to pay on their gas and electric bills. So it's all um, 
you know, you it, you're always robbing Peter to pay Paul, as the saying goes. So this is all intertwined in the lives of the communities that we serve. So thank you again. Um, please feel free to send an email to me if you have any questions that didn't get answered during today's session and look for an email coming from me with a set of links and attachments related to today's content. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.